hospital. Yeah. Let's go back to your conversion a little bit. Now, you're French-Canadian by birth. Oh, yes. And mm -hmm. during the World War II, you were in the Navy. Yeah. Now, just coming out of the Navy, some things happened where you got drawn into not passive, but outright demonic association, worship, mm -hmm. and the spiritualistic movement. Yep. Uh, tell us a little about that so um, folks know where you've yeah. come from. Coming out of the Merchant Navy, uh, I discovered there was thousands of uh, enlisted men that were looking for jobs if they were no longer in service. And to get jobs where in Montreal was uh, kind of difficult. And I took a, a job to get me uh, making a living at the Windsor Bowling Alleys and Billiards on, in West St. Catherine Street, which is the main street of Montreal. And um, I was assistant to the manager of the billiard room. That's where all the wealthy people, you know, play mm -hmm. billiard. And so it turned out to be that one evening, about six o'clock, this fellow come walking in there and said, hey, Marno. I turned around and looked at him. He said, you're alive. I said, of course I'm alive. Yeah, I heard that you were torpedoed in the North Atlantic and that she died. You've had this problem all your life, haven't yeah, you? People I, think I, you're dead. <laughs> people so. misunderstand me. Yeah, he said, man, you know, nice to see you, and you know, shook my hand, and yeah, he said, why don't you have dinner with me tonight? I've got a lot of nice, interesting things to tell you, man. Wow, my life is full with, with well-being. I said, what do you do, inherit a, a few million dollars? No, oh, no, it's better than that. Better than that. Can you do that with my weed? So I asked my boss, could I take the evening off? And it was like on Wednesday evening, there wasn't too many people there. Yeah, he said, we can't take it off. So we're sitting, you know, eating our meal, and he says, man, he says, let me tell you, I have become a member of a society who communicate with the spirits of the dead. How would you like to talk to the spirit of your dead mother? She came out the drive when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. and I said, I wouldn't be interested at all. Hey, man, he says, I talked to my dad, he says, the things that he's doing is fabulous. These, these, the spirits that were departed loved ones, are interested in our well-being here in this land and they want to help you. Mm -hmm. they, want to, they want to be with you, they want to, they want to help you. So uh, he told me, well, you know, why don't you come to a seance with me next, next Saturday night? And uh, I said, no, I'm not interested really, to be honest with you. And I tried to change the subject, but he wouldn't change the subject. He says, no, look, he says, you're chicken. I can't tell. He says, I knew more no, when, when he was afraid of nothing, you know. Uh, you, were, you painted the 70 foot uh, main mass on a ship. He said, nobody else wanted to go out there. And he said, now he said, you're chicken. Or are you going to come with me Saturday night? I said, I'll go with you. And that's the way it started for about for a few months. We had dealt with these seances and some many very interesting things happened. <laughs> if you want to hear about it, I'll tell you, but I think I'm better go now, on. Some of that is in one of your books. Is that in the, uh, Trip into the Supernatural? Trip into the Supernatural. Right, okay. There's one. That's it. So. <laughs> That's called a plug. <laughs> you hold it <laughs> well, you told me that the cameras would pick That's it up, right? right? Yeah. You got to so hold that... it fast. Hold it for a little while, and then we we'll put yeah. it down. That's good. Okay. Well, all I'm trying, all I'm trying to do, I want to be recognized. People say that I'm dead. Yeah. I'm not dead no, I can see that. <laughs> you see my bushes here. This guy's not dead, you know. So you, a number of fascinating things happened at these seances, yep. and but finally, you actually got to the place where, mm -hmm. at one point, you, things were flying around the room, and you were having. Uh, Demons and spirits yeah. were speaking to the group and making promises. And I'm going to tell you a very short little story here. We go to one of these seances one Saturday night, sorry, Saturday evening, and there was a guest uh, exorcist, whatever you want to call him, medium, uh, that was uh, speaking there. And um, my friend says, hey, by the way, this big, great uh, man, the band leader, Mm -hmm. famous band leader is going to be there with his wife. I said, really? Oh boy, I, need to, I, I like to meet him. Now this, they, this man belonged to a, uh, a high uh, Luciferian mm -hmm. society of spirit worshippers. And um, what happened <coughs> that the spirit had, this a spirit counselor that is one of Satan's top angels, had told the um, uh, high priest of the society, just about a year before, that the great master wanted to bring two individuals in to the society that would be a tremendous asset to the group in Montreal, and had given our names, but the priest had forgotten all about that. 
And uh, what happened is, is that, uh, that this George, this uh, band leader, he was told by the, by the angel, you go with your wife to this seance. Uh, you look like you're really enjoying yourself, but you're there for one purpose, to bring these guys into the society, and here's, here's how you're going to do it. When your wife is engrossed with talking with the visiting um, uh, medium, mm -hmm. and you see that these fellows want to leave, you tell your wife that you're going home to rest, but she can come home with the Belengers, which live right just a few houses away. And the angel told him, walk out at the same time with the two filers and ask them if they're driving or taking the streetcar. So we walked out of there, you know, and George says, hey, uh, listen, you guys driving? No, so we're taking the streetcar two blocks away. Oh, jump in the car. He had a nice big Lincoln, brand new one. We jump in the car, he says, I'll drive you there. And uh, on the way there, he says, hey, man, why don't we go to a fancy restaurant on West St. Catherine Street and uh, we'll have some good food and have a couple of drinks. And you tell me more about your merchant uh, experiences, see? So, okay. When, after we're sitting there, he says, how long have you guys been involved in sorcery? I said, what? Yeah, he said, how long have you guys been involved in sorcery? He said, you know the, the spirits, the, the supposed spirits of the dead? They're not the spirits of the dead. They're demon spirits. And they're deceiving everybody. And uh, they're of the lowest ranking of, of uh, uh, Satan's okay. angel. Mm -hmm. And he goes on telling us a little bit more, and he invites us to uh, one of their meetings for the following week, no, for the Wednesday evening, and uh, the following e evening. But, you know, by the time we left there, he was so lit that I said to myself, this guy will never pick us up, you know, to go to this, this meeting. But sure enough, Wednesday evening, give us a ring, you know, to, well, my uh, friend lived about two blocks away from where I lived. But uh, he picked us up, brought over there, and introduced us to the, uh, this, uh, the members of the secret society. And I was very amazed because of the fact that they were all professionals, mm -hmm. uh, merchants, uh, people, uh, business people of, of great capacities, wealthy people, and there was a number of medical doctors and attorneys and people that Now at this point, you realized this risk. society, they were not just mediums doing seances, you knew that this was the yeah. underworld. They had uh, beautiful paintings, uh, life-size, mm -hmm. of angels that had appeared, Satan's angels, uh, dressed in different uh, garment of different ages, and they had materialized. First they had materialized in those forms, then they were photographed, and then they made pa the, uh, paintings of them. And when I visited the uh, worship room of the gods, uh, I was amazed to see there was over a hundred of those beautiful paintings all around the worship room of the gods, and they were all uh, uh, Satan's top-notch uh, spirit uh, counselors. So, so they had these life-size paintings yeah. of demons that had once mm -hmm. appeared right, and they made angels. paintings out of them. We were so amazed, my, my uh, friend and I, we couldn't believe it. That, uh, you know, having been born and raised a Catholic and you think of the devil, you know, being in the middle of the earth and fire, you know, mm -hmm. covered with soot, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, you look terrible. <laughs> and uh, then you find out that, you know, the great conflict that started in the courts of heaven. And the demons are beautiful. And the, the, the angels uh, since they are beautiful beings, bright, beautiful beings. Mm -hmm. The high priest told me that uh, when well, he was in Chicago visiting there, that an, an angel appeared to him, and he says the, the brightness was so great that he couldn't look upon the, upon the being, uh, but closed his eyes. And uh, the spirit counselor, the angel, told him that uh, the fellow that he had left in charge, the other priest mm -hmm. in Montreal, was about to wreck everything that this, the spirits had done to bring my friend and I into the society. And that he ought to phone immediately and get this guy to change his mind. He, he had not, uh, when George wanted to phone him and says that, that he would like to bring us, he said, no way. He said, uh, if the high priest wants to have, him, have them here, he's going to have to be here himself. And that'll be in the future. Now, I remember reading that the spirits were offering different gifts and powers, and at one point, you received the power to get dreams about what horse to bet on, 
Oh, yeah. And you won. You, the bookies finally told you to stop coming yeah, because you yeah. won several days in well, a row. Is that they, right? They told me that they were going to put a bullet in me. So when I heard that, I said to the guy, I won't come back here. <laughs> but every yeah. race that you bet on, you won for several yeah, here's days. here's what happened. The high priest uh, uh, told us, my friend and I, that the great master would very much like to have us initiated into the society on the 31st of October at uh, their uh, resort in the Laurentian Mountains, north of Montreal, north of mm -hmm. Saint Agathe. And uh, that, uh, you know, he, he wasn't able to tell us what the great master wanted us to do as a career, but that it was going to be a, a tremendous important work that the two of us were going to have to do. Well, my friend says, well, you want it to be, to, 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 to be initiated any time. But uh, I said to the priest, you know, uh, uh, at that time, you know, I didn't know very much. I said, my reverend, you know, I call the guy the reverend. I uh, understand how the great master may want us to be initiated now, but somehow I don't feel that I want to be initiated this time. What about maybe like in the spring of the year or something like that? He said, well, I'll tell you what, I don't know. He says, you, you don't, don't want to buck the good master, the high master, because the great master, because he says it's, it's very bad. So, he said, And Look. the great master is who? Is Satan. Okay, I just want to clarify that. The great master is Satan. No. But is they still, offering they still refer gifts. to him as the great master or Lucifer. Or Lucifer, okay. We don't call him the, uh, Satan. Uh, there are very few reference, but very few. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, look, I'm going to do something for you guys, especially for you, Roger. I'm going to pray to the, the great master that he give you a gift. What kind of like and give three or four or five and choose whatever you choose, it says, will, will be yours. And I said, well, you know, it would be mighty nice if I had the gift of uh, clairvoyance, where I could see, uh, you know. Uh, clairvoyance, the bouquets, yeah. See, at the, at the bouquets, you know, you play the horses, uh -huh. you go to the bouquets, and you see all the name of the horses and, and the, the tracks, Belmont, or whatever they're running, you see. And, uh, and to know which was going to be the winner. I said, that'd be great. It could make myself some nice money. He said, that would okay. probably work with the stock market, too, then. You yeah, it would probably work with anything, you know. <laughs> but he said, he, he said, that's yours. You, you got it. And sure enough, just a, uh, a little bit later, uh, I had a dream. And I dreamed that I went, uh, that I went to the bookie and on a Saturday morning, and the, uh, I saw like a calendar date and everything. And I saw the, all the horses running at three different races. And the winner was the one that, that shone. It was shiny. So, shiny. Mm -hmm. And that was one there. It was 21 to 1, this guy, this horse. It was so bad, you know, the possibility of, of winning was so poor that he was paying 21 to 1. In other words, if you put a dollar down, yeah. you, pay, you get 21. See? Mm -hmm. He wins. Well, that was a shining one. I said, boy. Then I said, the other one, it, 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 uh, you, you look good. So I said to myself, well, you know, in those days, money was. was, was uh, you know, you, you scarce, get, scarce. So I said, well, I'm going to put two dollars on this guy. You know, so I put two dollars on it, and then uh, he wins. That was first. Then I put, uh, I put uh, twenty dollars on the twenty-one to one horse, and that one, and then that got the attention of everybody. Everybody said, I can't believe it. Some guy were knocking their, their heads, excuse me, knocking their <laughs> fist on the counter. <laughs> you know, because they they said this horse is totally. Worthless. He shouldn't have been in this race, and then he wins. You know, and so I was listening to these guys, and I said, boy, so you, you know what happened? When I came back there the, the, the following week, well, yes, I went out, I left out of there with a bundle of money in my pocket. I went down to the St. Catherine Street. I went to one of the fine men's store, and I bought myself a $200 suit. That's a lot of money back then. In those days, in 1946, yeah. a lot of bundle of money. So anyway, I came back the next week. And the uh, man in the cage says, you're Roger. I said, yes, as I was putting some money down. He said, uh, the boss would really like to see you. The bookie boss. Yeah, the boss, okay. the owner of the operation. And he says, you go to that door right over there. I said, okay. So he gives me my tickets and I go in there and knock. Come on in. You know, it was all in French, of course. <laughs> uh -huh. Entrez, monsieur. Oh, right, then he sees me. Oh, you're the guy, you're Roger. I says, yeah. Come here, he says, sit down right there in front of my desk. He got up and he walked around, make a big circle around me, look at me, sit back again. He says, you don't look like a winner. You don't look like a guy, you don't look like a man that knows anything about horses. Well, I said, I don't. I just happen to be lucky. He said, I'll tell you what, I don't know where you're getting your information, okay? But I don't, we don't like it here anymore. You're taking too much of our nice money. 
So I'll tell you what. The next time that you're in here, I'll let some, I'll let some of my goons after you. And you'll put a bullet right up there, man. And I won't have you around here again. Now, if you want the, the, the address and names of different bookies in Montreal, I'll give you a whole list of them. I said, no, it's not necessary, sir. I want, I want to come back. <laughs> so that he was knew, the beginning. He knew yeah. you had inside information. He just didn't know how inside it yeah. was. Right? So the pressure mounted, the pressure mounted to be initiated. And this was in October. And I came home on a Wednesday evening, and after the hypers had put a lot of pressure on me, and I, I went uh, to bed, but I couldn't sleep. About 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm, I'm sitting, laying in bed there, and now this was a prayer, mighty beautiful prayer, very short, and I never thought I was, I was praying. But here, listen to this. I said, if there's a God in heaven who cares for me, see that? Mm -hmm. Who cares for me, help me. I don't know how long I stayed awake after that, but the next thing I knew, my alarm clock rang, and uh, I got up and went to work. Is that something? Now, something beautiful happened. I am working in, in the embroidery factory, and I was working on my machine, and the, the uh, three o'clock coffee break came in the afternoon, and uh, I went out, outside to, to have my smoke, and uh, one of the bosses, you see, they were Jewish, uh, two owners. One of the bosses said, hey, Roger, uh, when you come up, uh, uh, come into my office, I want to talk to you. I said, okay. So I came back to, uh, up and he said, uh, come on in, uh, close the door. I said to myself, what in the world is going on? He never closes his door unless he wants to fire somebody. You know, <laughs> I learned that by, by observation, observation, see. I said, well, what's the problem? Well, there's no problem. But he says, I, well, he says, you could call it problem probably. You know, you, you notice this guy that was here this uh, morning that I showed around the shop? I said, yeah. I said, the black guy? Yeah. Well, he's going to start working here next Monday. And he's a Christian, but he keeps the, the, the Jewish Sabbath. What do you mean he keeps the Jewish Sabbath? Yeah, he keeps the biblical Sabbath of creation, that God created the world, the earth, and blesses us the seventh day and all of that. Mm -hmm. He keeps it like the Jews do, like the Orthodox Jews do. So I said, so what? I want you to find out what denomination he belongs to. It's haunting me, this thing. He says, I, would, I, hardly, I could hardly sleep last night that I had to find out what denomination this guy belongs to. But he said, I'm not going to start doing this kind of work. He says, you're my friend, give me a favor, find out for me. I said, sure, no problem. And he said, I'll have him work on the machine next to you. So this is in the embroidery, the embroidery factory. factory. He said, you're going to have a lot of chances to talk to the guy, but don't let him know that I'm the one that wants to know what denomination he belongs to. Okay, don't worry. So to cut long story short, my machine, was breaking threads and I had to back it up and start over again. And I got very, very unhappy with the whole thing and I started to call the saints. I was a Catholic then, when I was a former Catholic, you know, I was calling the saints I had done from heaven. And uh, <clears throat> so the coffee break came at 10 o'clock, went on downstairs and I was telling Cyril, I said, uh, have you ever seen anything like this taking place? The boss comes over, adjusts the machine, he works 20, 15, 20 minutes, thinking he's worked beautiful. I get back to the machine, the threads start breaking right away. I said, I don't know what it is. Uh, I said, you have any suggestions? He says, well, I'll tell you what. He says, if I were you, I would take it easy on the Lord. I could hear you talking to the, 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 the saints up there a little while ago, but he said, and he said, I heard the name of the Lord, and I thought, seeing that you've asked my opinion, I, I, I like to tell you, take it easy on the Lord. Maybe things will go better. I said, to, I said there's my opening. I said, say, man, I understand you're quite a religious man. What denomination do you belong to? He said, I'm a seventh Adventist. A seven dead. A seven, a seven, what? He said, I'm a seventh Adventist. And he explained what the name meant, you know. Wow, I said, this is interesting. It's interesting. And, and I asked him some, some other questions. And then uh, it was time to go back upstairs. I said to him, I said, look, did you bring your lunch? He says, yeah. What about us sitting on the, on the loading dock in the back of the place there and have our lunch together and you tell me more about your religious convictions about his business of the Lord coming and you know resurrecting people and recreating the earth later on and all of that and you're not going to be just a spirit flying on a cloud in heaven if you're saved into God's kingdom he said yeah you will talk about it so we had a good hour of talking and in the afternoon about two o'clock the spirit started to oppress me it was uh, in the month of October the windows were open about maybe four or five inches in the plane it was cold cool and I was starting to perspire so I took my uh, 
shirt and uh, oh, unbutton it and roll my sleeves and I was still perspi perspiring more. So I went to the men's room and once I lo clogged, I, I locked the door, I, I was being grabbed and choked. And uh, the pressure was so great that I stood over the, over the toilet and the water was just pouring down there. And I said to myself, unless Cyril's God help me, the spirits are going to do me in. And instantly, just... So you knew that uh, you had the demonic powers that were trying to choke you right then. And yeah. So uh, at 3 o'clock, <clears throat> no, it was at 5 o'clock, uh, I told him, I says, uh, what streetcar do you take? Why do you take the streetcar? He says, well, I'll take it about uh, two blocks down here. I said, I want to walk with you. Uh, listen, uh, if I went over to your house, could you show me in the Bible, uh, you know, the things that you were telling me today uh, about uh, your religious convictions? Oh, yeah, he says, I'd be glad to. I said, yeah, okay. Uh, he said, what about next weekend? Oh, no, no. I said, I mean, this evening. This evening? Oh, it's not a good evening. He says, I have a guy that's supposed to come and buy my jazz records. And he says, uh, you know, I've already promised him, put him off two or three times. I said, well, I'm sorry, but I surely would have liked to just stay in the Bible with you. He said, what about tomorrow night or the night after? I'd be too late, my friend. Too late. Forever too late. And he said, okay, you'll be here at, be at our home at 7 o'clock. And uh, we'll be waiting for you. Now I get to his place and uh, introduce me to his wife. And then he says, well, uh, I've got to explain something to you. Edison. He said, you know, I'm not a Seventh Adventist. Uh, actually, I told you I was a Seventh Adventist because it just, you, know, you asked me and I said it was the easiest thing for me to do. I didn't have a lot of time to explain. Uh, I'm not a baptized member of the Seventh Adventist Church. I probably will be baptized for too long because I'm just about making my, my decision in regards to the Sabbath. But he says, my wife is a Seventh Adventist. And he says, she will give us, uh, you know, she, she'll conduct the Bible studies tonight. If that's okay with you, I said, yeah. And she explained that they had these little Bible studies, 28 Bible studies for Wednesday people. And on one sheet, which is represent one study, was about maybe 18, 20 questions. Mm -hmm. And then you look up the answer in the Bible. So I said, that's fine. So we had a first Bible study, the Word of God. And then it's 8 o'clock. And I said to Cynthia, uh, she's smiling now. Get it. That girl, she remembers that like it was yesterday. And it's 51 years ago gone by. I said, Cynthia, what's the next Bible study entitled? Oh, that's Daniel 2. I said, yeah, what is it about? So he told me a little bit. I said, hey, let's have this Bible study right now. No, they said, why not come back maybe then next weekend? <laughs> no. I said, tonight, right now. So uh, several said, okay, let's have it. So now it's nine o'clock. Oh, I said, what a fantastic study. Well, how interesting. And I said, what's the, the third study title? title? And she, she looked at several and uh, she said, it is such and such. I said, fantastic. Let's have, have the study also. I said, what time do you people go to bed? Oh, they said, we go to bed about 11 o'clock. But after you, after, he said, after I listen to the evening news. Beautiful. I said, we have time for another study. <laughs> and he said, let me explain to you. We've got a pro real problem here. He said, you know, our minister has been giving us a lecture on how to give Bible studies effectively. And he tells us that we should never give people more than two Bible studies per week. And they should be like one, maybe like on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, and the other one like on Sunday you know, or Saturday or something like that. And he said, you know, we've already had, how many do we have now? Three? Mm -hmm. Two? So anyway. And he said, we've already passed our quota. I said, <laughs> I'm so glad that you told me that, Cyril about your minister. I tell you what, I promise I won't tell him a thing. You know what I'm <laughs> I won't tell him that uh, when I meet him that we had uh, three or four Bible studies the first night. Yeah, that's forbidden, we know that. That's right. <laughs> he said to Cynthia, you might as well go ahead, Cynthia. So Cynthia had another Bible study. Now, it was uh, uh, 10 o'clock. I said, was it the fourth one? He said, she won't tell you the name, the title. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I thought you people were really nice, loving Christian that wanted to help a poor lost soul, you know? <laughs> and here you are, refusing to give me another Bible study. I said, <laughs> I said, hey, I just can't, you know, 
figure this out. He said, what, hap what would happen if we didn't study tonight? I said, I'll tell you what, let me be uh, honest with you, okay? I cannot tell you the reason why I want all these Bible studies. But if I am back here tomorrow night for the fifth Bible study, it will have been a super miracle of God that I'm alive. Mm -hmm. Cheryl said, you make it sound like a matter of life and death. I said, it's exactly what it is. And I'll tell you later if things turn out good for me. I was as sure as I was sure that the sun's going to rise tomorrow that the spirits were going to do me in that night. The high priest had told us about a couple of accidents that had happened to some of their members that had decided that, well, no, no, this is really not for me. One guy, you know, he, he told the high priest, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to excuse me from this uh, fellowship. He says, it's not for me. The, the guy says, wait a minute, don't you back off on, on the ma great master because it'll cost you your life. And he said, <laughs> that'll be the day. He went away and the, the, uh, he left that day mm -hmm. from work and the uh, spirit counselor, the angel appeared to, to the high priest and said, the man is going to die in a car accident is, uh, down the road and he's going to be decapitated. And that's exactly what happened to him. So, uh, uh, you know, I knew very well that the spirits were already uh, well aware of what I was doing and I was not going to be around very long. And you knew that, uh, or at least you believed, yeah. that if you went ahead and tried to leave this satanic society that yeah. you were done in Cosmo for. That's life, yeah. So, um, uh, that night I said goodbye, didn't expect to see them again. But the next morning I woke up, you know, and I, I was expecting some kind of an accident on the way home. But I woke up the next morning, man, life, you know, it's beautiful, my life. And uh, I had, uh, of course, get them, them to commit themselves to more Bible studies for Tuesday, you see, at least once. That once. was the next day? Next day. So the next day when I was there, we had four more. <laughs> you see? Now I was sure <laughs> that I was not going to see them on Wednesday. I shook hands with them and said, well, if I'm still alive, I'll be here tomorrow night for Bible study number 489. See, we had 28 Bible studies in one week, seven days. So, so what happened here? I'm getting ideas for a new evangelistic series. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> what happened here is that uh, uh, by Tuesday night, I was so sure that I would not live any longer. That uh, I figured, well, it was nice to learn the truths, mm -hmm. truth about the Creator. Because the high priests always talk when, you see, they don't refer to God as God. They always refer to God as the Creator. Always as the Creator. The great God is Lucifer, the great master. Yeah. So don't give glory to God for anything except that he's the Creator. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's the thing. Now, Wednesday when I came back from those Bible studies, I was so thrilled in my soul, I didn't know how to pray. But there was in my being an elation of such happiness toward the God who cared, you see? Mm -hmm. the, I didn't know his name, but I knew that he's the God that cared. Because I said, if there's a God in heaven who cares for me, help me. So, we had two more Bible studies, and those Bible studies did for me marvels. By the time that the two other Bible studies were finished, we had four more, by the way, two more after that. But now I knew within myself that I had a great master also, and that he was way better than the great master that I had been serving for a while. Amen. And also, I became very daring. I, de I determined right there and then that with the grace of the Lord Jesus and the power of God and his Holy Spirit, I didn't have to worry about the high priest and about the bullets, mm -hmm. and about the capitations to accidents. Now, let me interrupt you. How long ago was this? 51 years ago. And you did 27 Bible studies in one week. 28. You know, you've already heard Brother Morneau allude to it, but the couple that gave him those Bible yeah. studies is here with us tonight. Would it be all right if we asked them to stand up? Please, yeah. Uh, is it Cecil and Cynthia? Would you please stand yeah. up and show the Bible studies? Yeah. 
come, come up on the step or near the steps. Come up, come up a little closer. Come near the steps. So Cecil see is you. holding up. This is the set of Bible studies that he gave Roger. Yeah. Uh, Twenty. What? Over fifty years ago. Yeah, that's correct. Fifty-one. And isn't that incredible? Boy, you needed a magnifying glass for these That's back right. then. That's right. The printing was very fine. I can no longer read them. <laughs> you can't read them anymore. They're too small. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. That's, I think, remarkable how the Lord has preserved them. And I'm sure that this couple really did not expect that those Bible studies they were giving were going to result in a ministry that would be, in essence, touching the lives of uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. And so when you give a Bible study to one person, never underestimate what the long-term influence of that is going to be. Isn't that wonderful? So, um, uh, this is about all I'm going to say about, about this part of it. Uh, on Wednesday night, I, I, when I got home, I had a letter in my, uh, a note on my door from my friend. Mm -hmm. On Thursday night and Friday night also, because, yeah, I was, we were finishing our studies at 11 o'clock and it took me an hour to get home on, on the streetcar, which meant that I got home at 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. He had been around to try to talk to me, but he couldn't uh, get a hold of me. He didn't know where I was. And, but on f uh, Saturday night, he told me, he said, the high priest has informed me that the spirits are going to destroy you and there's a big price already been set on your, on your, on your head. You see? I need to talk to you, please call me. And uh, I decided there was a, there was a, a pay phone in the hallway uh, downstairs in, in the foyer, but I decided I'd better go to a restaurant down the street uh, so I can uh, talk privately. And uh, I called him up and he told me, he says, I gotta talk to you, man. He said, your, your, your life is worth nothing. He says, you're, you're not gonna live. He says, if you don't come back to the great master, he says, uh, tomorrow, this will be your last chance. And he came to visit me and he tried to convince me in, in two hours time that I should come back to the society. I said, no, no, I'd be a loser. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you'd be a loser? He says, you'd be wealthy, you'd be famous, and you'd be doing a tremendous work that could benefit mankind. I said, I know exactly how sin benefits mankind. And uh, beside that, I said, I got a new master, <laughs> and he's super wealthy. And besides <laughs> that, not only does he promise me gold and silver and abundance after the resurrection, the first resurrection, Amen. but he promises me a hundred million years of living plus. Mm -hmm. And he's told me that this is going to be just the beginning of the good life. Amen. <laughs> so my friend looked at me and he says, you're either crazy or you're telling an awesome truth. And I said, I'm not crazy, but I'm telling you an awesome truth.